morning, everyone. Welcome back to Black Tech Queens on Flags 365. My name is Karima Campbell, and today I'm going to be interviewing another amazing tech queen. So for those of you who are new to Black Tech Queens, let me share our vision with you. It's all about inspiring each other and future talent. It's about helping achieve our aspirations and recognizing and celebrating our achievements. But remember, don't let our name fool you. It's not only Black Tech Queens that can join, we want everyone involved. We wanna build out our community of allies too, because ultimately, the more of us, the more built out our community is, the further we can get together. So let's build our community share this video, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Black Tech Queens. So over the past few months, we've taken a bit of a hiatus and we spent time planning for 2022. We've hosted in-person events, but most importantly, we've just taken the time to look after both our physical and mental health. And so for those of you who weren't able to attend our in-person I Am Remarkable session, which was hosted at 20 Cavendish Square, um, you've not missed out. We're going to be doing a virtual session at the end of this month. So just keep an eye on our social media and you'll be able to get all of the information on there. So you don't want to miss out this time, so make sure you keep an eye on it. Um, we've also been super busy attending various events which took place during Black History Month. And as usual, it was just amazing seeing so much black excellence in one place. And I really, really hope that the momentum not going to die just in October. We want to keep showing our excellence and our talent throughout the year. So some of the highlights for me personally were the TLA Black Women in Tech book, book launch. And there we were able to hear from some of the women featured in the book during Fireside Talks. And I've got to give a special shout out to our very own tech queen, Marie, who you'll remember from June's show, who was the events manager for this. And I must say she smashed it. So good job there, Marie. Um, there was also the first ever UK Black Business Week with some key sessions on finance, technology, business. And there was a keynote from the legend that is Trevor McDonald. And he just shared his experiences and gave some advice to people trying to break into his industry and also further their career in their own industry. And this was topped off with the UK Black Business Show, which took place on the Saturday. And that had over 200 exhibitors there. So amazing, such an amazing time. And whilst we're on the topic of keynote speakers and great ones at that, we, can't, we have to talk about Will I Am at the Black Young Professional Leadership Conference. He really left us with some gems and really just gave a lot of food for thought, whether it be making sure that we're more aligned with, say, the Chinese and Indian community, or making sure that kids are taking a huge part in the growth of technology over the years. Really a lot to think about there. But whilst we're talking about the Black, um, the Black Young Professionals Network, it was actually at their conference in October last year that I met today's guest. And I'm really happy to say that she's now a colleague of mine at Relativity too. So let me introduce you to this technology sales queen and all round Black Tech queen, Brenda Malinke. Well, well, welcome to the show, Brenda. Thank you very much, Karima, and thank you for that um, warm introduction. I feel I feel amazing. The imposter syndrome is going to be crushed today. <laughs> We're not going to feel like imposters. Yeah, great to be here. No, good, and because you belong here, so remember that throughout. Absolutely, absolutely. Definitely. So I'm going to get started with the question that I asked everybody to start with. Well, I don't ask them this because they're not all Brenda, but tell me, <laughs> who is Brenda? Well. Brenda, first and foremost, is a mum, a uh, cat lady. I am a, a technology sales person who loves to sell. And, and I say this with a, with a nothing gives me more pleasure. I couldn't imagine doing anything else 
but selling technology and technology solutions. Uh, I'm also a mental health advocate. Uh, I'm a sister friend. Um, you, the, I want to say the usual, but I don't think it's the usual. But more, more, more than closest to my heart is also uh, being a mental health advocate and just really creating spaces for people who look like me, who go through life experiencing similar uh, obstacles and challenges to what I would uh, experience, what my mum would have experienced, uh, making spaces to support those uh, uh, people like me um, to, to make sure that they have got the ability to express themselves and know that they can seek help and help is out there and, and lead long, happy, fulfilling lives. That is lovely. That's really good. And as I mentioned earlier, like mental health, I had to take a gap because there's just so much happening in life right now. If we don't, if we're not conscious of our mental health, it can just take you over. Yeah, oh, totally. Um, I was actually talking with a, a couple of friends um, last week uh, about mental health. Mm -hmm. and, and the way I, um, the way I view mental health is, um, it's, it's, to me, it's on a par with physical health. If you had a, a leg that was looking broken, you wouldn't carry on walking on it. <laughs> you, you would stop, sit down, put your leg up, call everybody you know, tell them to bring your dinner, wash your clothes, do mm -hmm. absolutely everything until that leg was good enough to walk. And mm -hmm. even then you wouldn't start running marathons on it. You would walk gingerly to the corner and back. You would then take a longer journey and build up until the point that you could go further. But even after that, you would always be conscious that your leg is potentially uh, going to break and mental health is exactly the same it's absolutely the same i can't put it any different you've got to be aware of it that it's about to break if it looks broken you've got to stop sit down get all that help that you can take from anywhere and everywhere and and i mean anywhere and everywhere uh, and once you're feeling back like oh i'm okay now you can't just start running a marathon you've got to take it easy you've got to break yourself into it and once you've broken into it and you're back in your stride, you've always got to be aware that there's a vulnerability in my in my mental health and I need to be mindful how I step and I need to be mindful how I go to preserve that. So it, it's it's a conscious effort, but once you do it all the time, it's no effort at all. Yeah, absolutely. I remember um, when I did my mental health first aid training years ago, one of the key things that stuck with me was an image that they gave of a bathtub and it was basically like everyone has stress and stress is good for you but just making sure that you're aware that you are reaching that point where not even your overflow is going to help anymore you want to make sure that you catch it before you start flooding the bathroom that's a really good analogy perfect yeah, that stuck with me but let's get back to you in your sales role you've mentioned yes. that you couldn't see yourself doing anything else why sales what brought you to that area the way I look at sales is I get to talk to people. I'm quite nosy by nature. So I get to ask loads of questions. Uh, I'd say it's 50-50 regarding uh, work related and me just being curious about the people I speak to. I get to speak to people from all walks of life, up and down the food chain, if you like. Uh, and in the process, I get to solve problems, which makes me feel good um, and earn good money. So I, I, I won't lie. <laughs> I don't do it for free. Nobody does it for free. But also, um, one of the things is, I guess, maybe in a perverse way, is it's made me really, really resilient because you can't sell without getting knockbacks. You get no's, no's, no's. You get so many no's before you get a yes. Yeah. But because I'm used to that, if in life in general, I get a knockback or a setback, I just, to me, it's second nature. It's just what it's done. So, yeah, um, I love sales for, for many reasons, but mostly because I get to talk to people uh, and know a lot of people and I've met uh, and made really good connections and really good relationships with so many people over the years. Oh, fantastic. So what was your journey to get into sales? What may, um, yeah, what steps did you have to take to get into where you are now? Okay. Um, so the story actually is one of, um, uh, so I'll go back to after I finished university, I actually did biomedical science at university which in my head and uh, I actually found a um, 
do you know at school we had like a high school book what you're going to be in 10 years time or in the future future brenda was going to be and i mm -hmm. kid you not an international scientist traveling around the world solving scientific problems <laughs> obviously very oh, vague. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, it, it almost fits yeah but in, yeah. it was very science focused and I, I and i went to unity by medical science um and life happened and um I lost my mom just in my final year and somebody as somebody who'd always had a mom as a big cheerleader in her academic endeavors losing my mom at that point just meant all oh, academia was out of the window i just basically thought oh, what's the point my mom's not here my cheerleader is not here to encourage me uh, it was a tough time but um so I, I i i didn't pursue biomedical science it was too much for me uh, so i thought i need to pay rent i need to pay bills uh, i've got debts uh, and i started working in uh, mns food store and it was fun it was a really good fun fun shit fun fun gig uh, i'd wake up in the morning go in <laughs> do what i needed to do i knew all my class customers all the regular early morning ones i knew which ones like croissants and and, and i'd finish work at two o'clock and then i'd go home or i'd go to the cinema uh, but I couldn't pay the rent. <laughs> so I was sat there one day thinking, I really need to do something. This is a fun gig. But and I just thought, maybe I need to do a different job. And um, I don't know if it was in the metro. It's actually metro. This is when I lived in Manchester. You know how you have those little small job ads? Yeah. And there was the one that said, earn £250 a week. Without showing my age, that was a lot of money. That would have paid my rent. <laughs> that would have paid the heating, paid the debt, and then some. And I thought, it can't be that bad. Call the man and see what, what it's about. And uh, yeah, long story short, it was an outbound call center. That's like the hardcore, you're just mm -hmm. punching numbers. You've got a script and you've just got to hit it. And all mm -hmm. I ever had focus was, it's 250 quid at the end of the week. So do it. Uh, and that's how I got into sales. Oh, cool. First of all, that could have gone very wrong answering that ad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I realised this. <laughs> I realised this. It could have been like, eh, easy money. There was no easy money. It just earned £250 a week. But yeah, hindsight's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Cool. I used to um do what's it magazine subscriptions. I used to do mm -hmm. magazine subscription sales, and I know how exciting it can be with like the commission element as well. So yeah, totally. Yeah. The one person that says yes, absolutely, your whole day is made. So yeah, no, absolutely. So you did the um your tele sales role, yes. and so what happened next? So after that tele sales role, um. <sighs> It wasn't the greatest outfit I could have ever worked for. And it was a it was a lesson in making sure that your commission is secure. Uh, basically, I got done over and I got done over to the tune of three grand. I was absolutely fuming. I was like, this is commission that I've already spent in my head. This is going to solve a lot of problems. But, you know, uh, moved forward, left that place. Um, I, I got very lucky. And I, and I think sometimes we we don't always make room for the luck that we, we experience. I got very lucky. I spoke to a, um, a recruitment consultant who was really, really good. Um, uh, and she, she, I said to her, I'm going to go away for a week, um, but this is the kind of roles that I'm looking for. Um, and she said, okay, fine. When do you come back? I said, I'm back on, I remember it was a bank holiday Monday um, in May. And she said, okay, fine. Back in those days when you traveled, you couldn't use your mobile phone because it was super expensive. So I had no mobile phone. There was no internet cafes to go and sit at while you're on holiday. It was just literally go away and disappear for, uh, for, for, for seven nights. But in that time, she'd secured three interviews for me yeah. for sales. Uh, and one of them was with the Loot Classified Ads paper. And the other one was with Pareto Law and the other one was with a, another publishing company, but a much smaller one. And she was so convinced that the loot role was for me that she left me voicemails. She sent me text messages and she del hand delivered to my house the job role, what I needed to prepare. And she booked me in for an interview on the Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> Oh, so wow. I'm coming off my holidays and I've come out of the airport and my phone's ping, 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 ping. I'm waiting for the clock to go so I can check my voicemails for free. Uh, and I get home and there's all of this. And she's like, call me tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. We need to go through it. I need to prep you. I'm sure this is the right role for you, but I've got two more lined up for you later this week. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long and short of it, I went to the loot um, interview. It went really, really well. I got it. And that's where I got 
sales training and actual sales training and that it's not by chance it's not how you freight it, it was literally talking through the whole sales process from introduction to to fact finding to features and benefits and and all the rest of it and that it was actually a very systematic process but if you do it often enough and well enough and you get used to hearing and listening actively you can sell more often than not and if you can sell more often than not you become more successful and if you become more successful you want to sell even more uh, and then that's when um in that role i actually realized that sales is a profession um prior to that it was a job uh, that i was just coasting along and make a little bit of money and everybody used to say when when are you going to start your actual career and at that point i was like actually i have started my career this is it um yeah, so, you know, it, they introduced me to neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, which means something different in tech <laughs> and natural language program. It's like, well, hang on, we're not talking about the same thing here. Um, yeah, so I went on to Loot, and then after Loot, which was classified ads, I transitioned into software escrow, and that's where I really got into tech sales. Um, in software escrow, uh, essentially, it's... Um, it's a tripartite agreement between a software developer, uh, a software user, and a third party who holds the source code. And I work for the company that hold, held the source code in trust. So I would speak to software providers and software users, licensees, and say to them, hey, Mr. Uh, end user bank uh, or stock exchange or um, retail, high street retail, you have business critical software. Um, that you use every day, uh, but the source code is owned by this guy, third party. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a great big outfit and sometimes it's a very small niche outfit. Well, what are you going to do if they go bump or if they get bought out? If, if something happens, that would mean that your ability to operate um, using the software that's business critical, um, you know, is... is um, is, is that there's a damage to to that and what, what would it mean to you and they would say oh we couldn't absolutely work you know we couldn't book our hotels we couldn't do we couldn't do process our bookings or whatever and we'd say great if you sign this agreement you pay x amount of money uh we'll hold the source code if anything happens to these guys you can have it or you can give it to somebody else so i learned very quickly about different types of software about technology about pen testing, about security, about ethical hacking. So it was a whole different world. And you, when, you, when you work with tech, you speak to a very different person to when you're speaking to someone to sell uh, advertising spaces. And I found that very interesting. I found it very challenging um, in a good way that made me push myself to learn. And because I'm a curious sort, it suited me perfectly because Although my job is software escrow, the software escrow was for, it could be any walk, any country, any different time zone. Um, and that was super exciting. Uh, and then that was my journey into tech. Uh, and it has been tech, 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 tech since then. Yeah, cool. So you mentioned that it was quite challenging getting to terms with like the technical jargon and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were to redo it now, so if you were back at that stage, moving from the loop into that role, what would you have done differently? I think I would have tried to understand from the get go that it wasn't going to be a walk in the park. I thought I could wing it. Yeah. Uh, and I think I, I think in any role, when you start, there's an element of onboarding that takes place that you, you, you're going to be, you have to be a sponge. Mm -hmm. uh, and part what I didn't realize in that role, which why I found it challenging, perhaps, um, was that in the first three months, you're forgiven for not knowing stuff. So that's the time you really you want to take on board as much as you can, because it doesn't matter if you get it wrong, uh, mm -hmm. you're not going to coast. So by the time I realized that actually I'm going to have to to put some effort into this, I'm going to have to come in early, I'm going to have to leave late, you know, I'm going to have to maximize on or, or capitalize on the fact that I don't have children. I'm a singleton who plays netball and and that's it. You know, I go out, hang out with my friends. Um, I, I left it too late. However, I did manage to turn it around. And I think if I went back, I think it would be from day dot would be to give it 120 uh, percent. And it was a valuable lesson because ever since that um, role, anytime I do onboarding, I realize it's going to be a baptism of fire. And I never, ever want to feel, you know, after four months in a role, not getting the basics on what I should be doing. So, yeah. 
No, cool. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so at the beginning, when I asked you who you are, you lifted off so many things. And how do you balance it all? <laughs> um, balance it all by learning to say no and being okay to say no. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I think it was Oprah that I first heard say this, that no is a complete sentence and that I don't need to, to add any more than no. Mm -hmm. uh, and also just really um, trying to understand where my priorities lie uh, and delegating. So I find myself to be in a very uh, fortunate position of being a co-parent and a co-parent that works successfully, I would say. Um, it's not an easy thing to co-parent. You've got two, two people, two different households. Uh, these kids that have adjusted amazingly well and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't have asked for better. Uh, and it's in knowing that I prioritize my time when I've got my children um, and when I don't have the children, knowing that I've got time to really push myself. So I'm not flapping so but I manage it all by thinking right what am I wanting to achieve this year I want to make time for mental health I want to make time for women I want to make time for mentoring I want to make time for projects from Malawi where I'm from yeah. and then I think right there feasibly we could do it it's going to take three four hours a month or whatever uh, and also just being able to review regularly like, do I still have time for this? Is this still going according to plan? Or do I need to step down? Or do I need to ask for a break? So yeah, a lot of juggling, um, a lot of, you know, I say no to a lot of things, but I try to be present in the things that I'm saying I'm going to do. Yeah, no, cool. I love that. I am so living by that now. No is a complete sentence. Absolutely. Because I'm famous for no, because and feeling that I have to explain myself, but we, should, we shouldn't have to. Like, no. and, and what I always say nowadays is if you say no and they really want to find out why, they'll follow up. You know, <laughs> They can follow up and say, is that no because? And you can say, you, then you're at liberty to explain or just mm -hmm. to say, no, not this time. So, yeah, if people really need you to do something, they'll follow up. Yeah, oh, perfect. Cool. So, um. I'm jumping right back, sorry. So That's you, okay. You went into software escrow and then yep. after that, um, what was your next step after that? So after that, I had the my family. So I had my baby, uh, Nossa. She she came along in 2008. <laughs> I'm sure, I swear <laughs> she's mine. <laughs> Don't ask me her birthday because I remember. In 2008, she came along uh, and I, I was in a, in a very privileged position to be able to, to start my family and not go back to work. Uh, and then my son came along in 2020 and I went back in 2011 to uh, a telecoms company and that was telecoms sales. Again, it was completely brand new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know anything. Um, and I'd been out of the workforce, if you like, a paid workforce for um, three years. And I was still feeding my son. Mm -hmm. through the night <laughs> so I was getting very little sleep yeah. and going to work and I just remember like um talking to my boss like a couple of years after I started said do you remember when I said I was a fast learner in uh, in the interview he goes yeah you totally blagged me Brad <laughs> he said you totally blagged me Brad it took you ages I'm like yes I wasn't sleeping he goes yeah we know we could see you were absolutely shattered but you, you always used to come and turn up I want to yeah. give you 100 percent so I joined an organization, um, uh, a telecoms company, uh, mm -hmm. and the division that I worked in was a niche division. So it was a company that had been bought out by a bigger company, but they had a, a niche technology that that they had, the guys who founded it uh, saw a gap in the market, got the technology together, and it was very simple. It was bonded ADSL. Uh, and in that role, I decided that I was going to learn anything and everything there was to learn about comms. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's not very much I don't know about internet connectivity, <laughs> whether it's on the infrastructure side, who owns what, who does what. Uh, mm -hmm. It's so bad because I will see vans up and down the motorway or down the street and I'll probably tell you what they're going to do <laughs> just, <laughs> just by, the signature, by the insignia on the van. Uh, and I'd, I'd, see BT, um, I'd see BT engineers and I'd walk up to them and say, what are we doing here? Because I wanted to make sure that I knew absolutely everything. Uh, mm -hmm. there was to know um and I stayed in that role for just shy of 10 years and uh, 
that was my role before I met you at uh, BYP last year. Uh, cool. Because this makes so much sense to me now. This is all falling into place because I was thinking like e-discovery industry that we were now working mm -hmm. is quite a niche industry that not many people know about. So no. I, I was going to ask you, like, how did you find that jump? But from what you're saying, it sounds like most of the roles that you've gone into Everything's are... Gonna jump. <laughs> <laughs> literally um and and uh, what makes me laugh is uh, when i went into telecoms because i hadn't been at work for so long i was really really my confidence levels were low and 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 when my boss says i blagged him i probably did if i had gone in there with the level of confidence that i actually felt rather than what i had to display to get the role i wouldn't have got that role but I always knew that I could get back into where I needed to be. Uh, and I remember, so in, in telecoms, we, uh, broadband is ADSL. Mm -hmm. That's the acronym you use for, for broadband, right? Asynchronous, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So, but I was so out of it, I couldn't say ADSL. I used to say ASDL. And my boss would go, uh, he could, I could see him cringing when I was on the phone to a client. I'm like, yeah, we can do the bonded ASDL. And I could see him gritting his teeth uh, mm -hmm. and looking back. I'm like, yeah, I just, I, I, you know, I don't know how I did it, but after a couple of months, ASDL started to roll off my tongue, SDSL started to roll off my tongue, Ethernet, Etherflow, everything started to flow off. And, you know, I talk telecoms in my sleep. It's incredible. And now going into uh, going into e discovery, I'm having to learn all kinds of words. <laughs> Closure. Oh, what's that when it's in America? Oh, great. Workflows. What are we doing with this? D SARS and all sorts. I'm just like, yeah, I'll get it. D SARS, D SOLS, or whatever. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so I've been, what is it now for me? Probably like 12 years or so in this industry, and I'm still learning stuff. So yeah, yeah. you're doing it. <laughs> I, I think what I have found in e-discovery specifically uh, mm -hmm. that I never had anywhere else is that everybody, and I mean everyone, has said to me that you could be in this industry for a long time and still be learning new yeah. stuff all the time. And what that's helped me do is just to take the pressure off in terms of trying to get to the level of expert and really just to learn for the sake of learning to get to a place where you're always knowing more, you're always learning more, as opposed to getting to a place where you say, right, I know it all now, um, because I don't think we'll ever get to that place, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in e-discovery. And I, there's so many moving parts as well, yeah. whether it's there's legislation, some... whether it's, you know, a different country. I mean, look, let, let's look at South Africa. You know, when I started, they didn't have the, the legislation for privacy. And now it's there. It, that means everything's changed. So. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of nuances that you only realise and learn as time goes on and over um, through experience and stuff. Totally, so. totally. Oh, cool. So whilst I was doing my research on you in preparation for this, I found your consultancy company. I found <laughs> your company. I found so much. Like, tell me about those stuff, Brenda. Okay, fab. So. 2020, what a year. I'm not going to go on about it like nobody didn't experience it. But I was one of these people that was put on furlough. And let me tell you, when they put me on furlough, it was a dagger to my heart. Because in my head, I was like, I'm a senior member of the team. You need me here. My customers need me. How, how, how are we going to manage this? My customers are going to be upset. They can't speak to anybody but me. That bit was true. They told me. The customers did. Like, are you coming back? I'm like, not allowed. I'm on furlough. Uh, so as somebody who has always worked, and I mean, if we look at the last 10 years since my babies were born, I'd worked, 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 and worked. Um, in my last role, I was a field account manager, which meant I was driving here, there, and everywhere. I would be in London for a meeting for half nine to finish, to be in, in Hertfordshire for a meeting at 12 o'clock or half 12, to finish to have a meeting in Peterborough at four o'clock. I was doing a lot of traveling. It was not unheard of for me to be gone for a week, you know, leave home on a Monday, come back on a Friday because I'm going to visit clients in Scotland. Yeah. So I went from somebody who was being very busy, always on the phone, always checking emails. If things go wrong, I want to get involved to get solutions and stuff to nothing, absolutely nothing. And that was a shock to the system and in the end I said just enjoy it just take the time out you know it is what it is you can pay the bills the kids are fine you're healthy you're lucky that you can stay at home 
um, just manage the anxiety levels. But then after a few months, I got bored. I really got bored. There's only so many quizzes you can do. There's only so many Zoom events you can attend. I felt like my brain was going to mush. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it was also a time where I noticed a lot of people were taking the leap to start their own businesses and coming out and saying, I've gone, I've gone into business. And what was happening was I would see a lot of them trying to sell and they couldn't sell. They knew what they were talking about, but they couldn't sell what it was that they were doing. And to me, it looked like very simple tweaks in terms of introducing what they were talking about. So, you know, they're not selling uh, great big enterprise software, they're selling a service and how you'd sell that is different and how you'd present that. Um, so I thought, hang on, I've got time. Uh, I checked with the, I checked with HR. I was like, is this is this allowed? And they were like, yep, fine. You know, got it all in writing. Don't want anybody getting in trouble. Uh, yeah. And then the day after my son's birthday, I sort of sat in the garden. The sun was out. Got the laptop out. Got my card out. Registered a little company. Uh, and then thought, right, let's get a uh, let's get this going. And do you know what? It was the one thing that's given me the most confidence, if I ever said, what's the one thing in life that's given you the most confidence? It was that act of saying, I've registered a business, told a few people. Now, once you tell people, you have to do something about it. You have to make it a success. Yeah. <laughs> so if you ever have ambitions and plan dreams, don't keep them to yourself because we are pretty rubbish at being accountable to ourselves. Tell yeah. everybody. And that just makes me want to do even better. So I got involved. Um, I started talking to people. I started offering, you know, short webinars just to say, let's talk about sales. Let's understand what you're doing. Um, then I got clients, paying clients, which was good. You know, I got people on one to one. Uh, and then I got reached. Uh, somebody reached out to me from the Middle East saying, I'm, I'm in a career. I feel stuck. Can you help me through? And to me, it was just like, wow, <laughs> I can. Yeah show people what to do and get paid for it. And this is something that I enjoy doing. Um, and ultimately, it's what led me to BYP because that was a space that I found really exciting. I found it super exciting last year. Although it was off the back of George Floyd murder, George Floyd's murder, sorry. Um, and all of that anguish, it was, it was pain. It was really, really painful, physically painful to watch and see all of that. And it just felt like there was an energy that I said, do you know what, I'm going to do more, I'm going to try and reach out to people like us that need it. Yeah. Um, and I want to be in those spaces, there was something about having the spaces there that was so empowering, and to see so much excellence, in a way that we don't get to see it. there was such a, a spotlight on people who do greatness, actually demanding to be seen as great. Say, no, you're going to acknowledge my excellence. You're going to acknowledge that I am good at what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really empowering to me in a way that it's never been before. And um, yeah, so I networked hard. I networked the dope black women, dope black moms. Um, I was on Instagram for the first time. <laughs> I was like, how does this thing work? Because I quit Facebook a long time ago. Yeah. And I was like, everybody's doing lives let's see what this is about i got to learn how to use canva i got to learn how to no, canva. Um, canva is awesome i still get the invoice because i'm scared of losing all my <laughs> all my artwork because every time you go to canva they're like are you sure i'm like no you got me it's fine it's cool download it all and then commit commit to it don't give me an out <laughs> i'll never go back <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I launched my Nango Malinki consultancy and that was for my mental health and well-being. Uh, I know some people did courses. I know some people learned languages. Some people learned how to cook. I just wanted to, to, to do more of the stuff that I knew I was good at and keep my skills up. Uh, I knew that trying to learn a language would stress me out. That was a, a big thing in my head that I was like, no, you you all go and get your degrees while you're in lockdown. I, I don't have it in me, you know. <laughs> I don't have it in me to go and and read a thousand books. I don't have it in me to walk a hundred miles a day. I don't have it in me. But once I realized that actually working for myself, sitting at my desk, you know, setting up a plan, putting a plan together, uh, doing something that I love, it was it was an eye opener for me. Uh, but ultimately. You know, I got to BYP and got to speak to Karima and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
cool. So can people still reach out to you for consultancy help? Yes, yeah, starting 2022. So I took time out uh, for this year because trying to get into e-discovery and do it well and be super successful, it needs absolute focus. Um, it's, I don't, I, this role was a big change and a lot of people put a lot of faith in me. Uh, people like Karima putting me forward for the role. Uh, people that uh, interviewed me and reporting back within the organization, they put a lot of faith in me. And what I never ever want to do is have somebody vouch for me and me let them down because I didn't try my hardest. So for 2021, it was literally about get into e-discovery, get into e-discovery in a way that you never find yourself as you did in learning about escrow the hard way. You know, it's a different kind of selling. It's a different kind of language. You know, you're talking to people within, I mean, my region has got over a hundred countries, for example, that I look after in EMEA. Um, so, you know, learn about South Africa, learn about Israel, learn about, you know, Italy, Spain, so different, <laughs> completely different. Uh, learn about France. Um, so this year was about growing in my role as a as an account executive within relativity but late next year from q2 onwards i'll be looking to to perhaps start looking at uh, speaking to people again and do some consultancy work on the side oh, that's fantastic and i love the way that you're prioritizing there because it's so easy to just keep going and taking more on especially because you loved what you what you love oh, totally Okay. Yeah. Totally. And and you know what, what you said, actually, now, as you're saying that, I could see the bathtub and I was like, yep, that, that would have been, you know, add on a bag of sand, whoosh, everything, everything else over. So, uh, yeah. So for me, I, I'm about making sure that I'm doing a good job mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't want somebody to come to me and say, well, can we work on this project? And then I have to say to them, well, I've only got an hour this week or I've not got an hour that week. It's got to be consistent because it's somebody's livelihood that I'm working with. I'm not, you know, I'm not shifting boxes. Um, if somebody wants to improve their selling, it means that they've got a target to hit. And I don't want to impact anybody's earnings by just not being present. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. No, that's so good. That's so good, Brenda. So we spoke about your great achievement with your consulting. Um, but I want to know what your biggest achievement to date is. Woo. So uh, I'm not going to say the kids, not because they're not a great achievement. I mean, humans, great. But I don't think they can hear you. They've heard it before. <laughs> we're very, we're very upfront and open in our family. <laughs> but I think my greatest achievement actually is taking ownership of my mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I own it 100 percent. So I had a a, a, a fabulous breakdown a very long time ago uh, in a way that I think could have very easily been something shameful, something to hide, something that I would be afraid of people finding out. It doesn't bother me who knows that I had a condition. It doesn't bother me who knows that I have to balance a chronic mental health condition. It really doesn't bother me. You, you can go and tell my boss, it won't bother me. Uh, what I have found in taking ownership is actually people want to help. You know, people will make, not allowances, they will accommodate what you need to do to be the very best version of you. So my biggest achievement is really coming from a place of shame, embarrassment, paranoia, to actually just owning it, saying, well, it's fine. Yeah, I'm on medication. My happy pills are not working. Sorry, <laughs> this is not going to happen today. Uh, you know, let's talk about taking pain. Don't, don't talk to me about taking vitamins because I know what my condition is. I know how it works. I know what works for me. Um, and, you know, in, in taking ownership and owning it 100%, I found that a lot more people feel they can talk to me about their, their conditions. And my my go-to line is I'm an expert in my mental health, but I'm not an expert in mental health. Do what I did is go and get help. Yeah. And, and that's as simple as that. As early as possible, before the bathtub is over flooding, you know, before the leg is broken, go and get it seen mm -hmm. because it's the only way. You If you lose your mind, you lose everything. Yeah. If you lose your leg, you can get by. If you lose your arms, you can get by. If you lose your mind, that's it. And and it's it's as simple as that. 
no, so yeah I that's my biggest that. achievement <laughs> It's so great. That's, I really love that because there's so much stigma associated with mental health. And so people speaking up about their experiences, that's helping to eliminate that and just make people feel more comfortable with just saying, look, I can't right now. I just physically can't. Yeah, yeah. totally, totally. And it's improved my friendships. Yeah. It's improved my relationships. Uh, and it's also eliminated naturally people who are not conducive to good mental health my good mental health and well-being um believe it or not there are some people who don't get it they 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 haven't learned or they've not educated themselves um some people genuinely see as i'm lazy or genuinely see as it's it's all in your head of course it's in my head <laughs> it's my head that's not working i'm not in my, it is in my head but it's not airy fairy thoughts it, it's physically my brain does not function the way it should be functioning yeah. um you know people think that you know i can diet it away or i can exercise it away or i can pray it away um and th there's merit in all of those solutions but it's not something that you can positively think it out of your system it, it really genuinely is and it got to a place where i had to say until you understand <laughs> let's keep it let's keep it uh, let's keep it moving so it, it to me make taking the ownership has just improved work uh family uh my relationship with my children my friends it, it's just made life a lot simpler because i can own it and also thankfully we have got laws in this country so if i've been up front with you and you yes. want to shift me oh, away, <laughs> guess what i know what's going on yeah. So, so let's just let's just keep it let's just let's keep it front up front right so everybody's frightened of telling their bosses and their company that they work for about their mental health because everybody feels like if my boss knows and i make a mistake or i need time off they're going to say oh this person's but if you know your rights and you understand what your rights are having an illness is not a reason to be dismissed it really really genuinely isn't and having a mental health illness there's a it's a broad range now uh, i'm a functioning fully functioning uh you know chronic uh, mental health sufferer but i have a full life like i couldn't tell you it, you know if, if you said mental health and then i turned up you might say hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but I am, a, I am a sufferer. You know, I've got, I've got a team that looks after me, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think once you start to understand yourself, you should take comfort and be confident in that. You know, we have got laws in this country to to support you, and that businesses are obliged to support you through that. Now, I'm not saying that every manager you're going to meet is going to be nice. But I'm saying that if you're in a if you're in an organization where the manager and management do not accept your mental health, that's not going to be the place you want to be because it will accelerate your mental health uh, problems. No, absolutely. And I'm really, I guess this is me with my blue sky thinking, but I do hope that eventually all all leadership will be able to understand that um, will yeah, ultimately be able to understand mental health and how to work with your team. And when I say how to work with your team, then as you mentioned earlier, it's not the same for everybody, but yeah. know how to find out from your team what works for them and what exactly. they need from you. So. Exactly. And I, I think that we're headed that way. I know we have Mental Health Week, Mental Health Awareness Week, so that way. It's slowly, 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 slowly. The, the, the analogy I like, there's two analogies I like to use. One is cigarette smoking and the other one is seatbelts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you taught, walked into a pub in 1960 and said smoking is bad for you, they'll be like, oh, here's the crank that doesn't like cigarette smoke. There's something wrong with her. Literally, they would smoke you out of the pub. Mm -hmm. If you turned up in the pub in 1970, two or three people might agree with you uh, and the rest would carry on with their cigarettes. If you did the same thing in, 19, in the 80s, you might have a few more people agree with you. And you might even have doctors say, well, we can't have patients smoking on the ward because really it's not great. If you do that in the 90s and early 2000s, no smoking in, in, in indoor spaces. And everybody understands why. 
the it's date, just that, um, the date that they stopped allowing smoking indoors was actually my birthday. It was on July the first. <laughs> amazing, <laughs> amazing. I can't forget it now. But you know, it was literally if, if you look at the time that it took to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a few people that were going to protest and smoke in pubs, and they were going to. It was on the news, and I was like, "What are they doing? Where they're not changing the law? This is a good law." And and I think that the awareness of it in the conscious like now if you go somewhere and someone is smoking indoors automatically everybody thinks what are you doing and it's not like we have to have discussions every we all know it's bad for you it, it's it's you know it's passive smoking is bad you can't walk around kids we we all have that knowledge it's got to a place where it's it's everywhere and i think mm -hmm. the more we talk about mental health the more we share about experiences the more that we learn as we move in time, it will be second nature to say, well, actually, this person's exhibiting behavior, that means that they're under distress. And what we do in first aid, mental health first aid, is we need to take them out of the situation because ultimately, if you've had a member of staff on your team for two, three, four years, and they start to have a, a, a challenge with mental health, they've got two, three years of, of experience on your team and, and, and loyalty to you. You want to make sure you look after them because it's not permanent. It passes. Mm -hmm. Just like a broken leg heals, your mental health is not permanent. It's not a constant, you know, you're 100, 100% of the time. So I'm, I'm confident that, you know, in a generation or two, generation will we'll be having these as just normal like oh i went to uh, i went to walking center for mental health today uh, but what we do need to do is talk to our elected leaders to put money in the system please vote wisely <laughs> can't stress that enough you heard brenda vote wisely i can't um, tell you who to vote for but just not the ones that make lots of cuts please <laughs> <laughs> we did um uh, we, we did a leadership um, a mental health training not too long ago and it yeah. was so good. I'm trying to remember the, um, uh, trying to remember the, um, the steps. So I'm going to share it on my, um, on the Black Tech Queen's Instagram in the next few days. I'll keep but, an eye on it. Yeah, please do. It was, um, there's a test when, uh, I really wish I remembered the letters, but there's a test when you're born, which mm -hmm. like your airway, your, um, yeah, your, yeah. Yeah. And they've got APGA for mental health. Yes. Yeah. I saw I it. Love, when I saw it, I was like, I love it. I've got the picture on my desktop right now. And I'm like, yeah. it's brilliant. Uh, it's actually very, very good because uh, somebody shared it on a Slack channel at work. And then I shared it everywhere. I was like, everybody needs to be doing this. Share it, in it, whatever you do. Because they explained it very simply. Very, very simple to explain. It's brilliant. Absolutely. I bet that person was in the same training as me. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. I was like, this is a really good, interesting graphic. Yeah. Out, right click, save, send. <laughs> oh, cool. All right. So we can literally speak all day, Brenda. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, before we start wrapping up, I have got a couple of questions from our community. So um, the first was, do you have to be technical to work in tech sales? I feel like you've touched on it a bit, but if you want to just answer that for them. Short answer is no. You do not have to be technical in sales. You need to know how to sell. And how to sell, you can learn. You can learn very simply by building on. And the more you sell, the more experience you do, the more you learn. Um, I still learn how to sell. Uh, my, my boss... Tell, she, she shares podcasts with me all the time. She shares podcasts with our team that I've got years and years of experience. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be technical to sell. You're not selling the tech. You're not selling. You're not building the technology. <laughs> That's not what I'm there for. We've got people yeah. like Karima that understand how these things work and where they break. And, and you know, we've got some people that have gone to school to learn how to build it and then build and break it. You don't need to be technical. It helps if you have an affinity for technical speak and affinity for how technology works. It helps because you'll be surrounded by people who talk tech all day and every day, and that's a passion for them. And people who you speak to, your potential clients are surrounded in a technical environment. So if, if you can't get your head around it or if it bores you, 
then I'd say no. But if you are happy to be immersed in that, uh, not necessarily knowing how things work, then I'd say, yeah, go for it. What you do need, though, is the ability to to learn how to communicate. And it's a two way. You speak to them, they speak to you, you get information and then you put the solution together. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And I like this one. How do you unwind? <laughs> Oh, this is my worst favorite, my least favorite question because the answer is actually really, really. Um, I'm gonna come clean. I unwind mm -hmm. by watching Judge Judy. Girl, I, love, <laughs> I love Judge Judy, and my favorite thing to do when I finish work is to sit in, on the sofa. My one of my cats comes and sits next to me, and I watch an hour or so of Judge Judy. Um, and I just unwind, not because there's anything particularly I could say to you that it's, uh, I'm sure I've watched all the shows before, but I just love the way she just takes up, she listens and she, uh, you know, she aligns the case and then she, she gets rid of them. She dispatches them. And, you know, there's lots of, um, you can learn a lot about life by watching Judge Judy, you know, a lot about life, what not to do, you know, never sue your kids, <laughs> never sue your, never sue your parents ever it never yeah. ends well uh yeah so yeah i unwind by watching judge judy but above and beyond judge judy i like uh plants so i have house plants um that they're not exotic or anything like that but i've had them for a long time uh i was growing my own chilies but i think i've gotten bored of growing chilies so this year i've not actually planted any new seedlings and i've given everything away uh, i also like to make clothes I like to paint, so it just really depends on what um, what I fancy to do at that point. But yeah, Judge Judy is up there more often than not. Uh, cool. I bet you didn't realise, but Judge Judy is kind of linked with your work because um, realistically, you could sell her relativity. So oh, totally. I I'm onto her already. I'm onto her already. <laughs> I I'm, I I'm in. I'm in litigation. One hundred percent. Let's do it. <laughs> no, cool. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start wrapping up now. So tell us what's next for you. So this year has been a whirlwind. It's been absolutely incredible to 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 be onboarded, to start a new role in a remote location, to be onboarded remote. Um, it's a role that takes a lot of boxes for what I wanted in my next step in my career. Um, next for me, I think it's I have a few projects that I want personal projects to achieve. Um, my children are now in secondary school uh, and, you know, it's a big push to get them to a place where they're going to be young adults uh, going off on their own soon. So for me, next is more selling, uh, still with relativity and really becoming a, a subject matter expert in my region where providing solutions for e-discovery is concerned. Uh, making sure that my consultancy stays alive and, vi and viable in the long term because we all have to have side hustles, I've been told, so that we're earning income in our sleep. Mm -hmm. Sounds like hard work, but if I can get there, I will. And also actually just staying healthy. Just uh, staying healthy is, is, is the priority for me always, above and beyond everything else. But, um, yeah, so more of the same but bigger and better. Perfect. That's great. All right. And I asked all of my guests this, but is there any advice that you'd give to someone either looking to break into technology sales or someone who's um, looking to further their career? Learning. Um, and, and I know I said at the beginning that learning, you know, it's, you've got to immerse yourself, but learn about what you want to sell, you know, um, and you have to love what you sell. You, you really, really have to love it. You have to believe it, it's the best thing. Uh, otherwise, you can't sell it. You really, really can't. So if you want to sell, you want to get into tech sales, you want to further your career, just keep learning. Never believe that you know it all. You know, always think, um, what else could I be doing? How else could I have improved that call? It literally, it does get down to the, you know, to that stage where I have a phone call with a client and I sit back and I think, what could I have done differently? You know, a lot of refer ask for advice and network, network, network. Just speak to everybody. Even if somebody that you've tried to sell to says no, never ever slam the phone down. Like, oh, that was a waste of time. No, it really wasn't because sales is cyclical 
at some point they'll move role they'll need something else your paths will cross i am amazed i have seen people that i used to sell to in telecoms turn up in e-discovery really yes wow okay and i was just like i know i know that guy <laughs> i know him i used to i used to do all his mobiles i used to do his phone system yeah, it's a good thing I left on good terms. And I actually said oh, okay. I'm goodbye, <laughs> you know, because it's such a small world and you, you never know where your opportunities are gonna come up next. Yeah, no, oh, great. All right, so we're gonna have to leave it here, but um if to find out more about what Brenda's doing, keep an eye on all the great stuff that's coming next year. Check out um the links in our bio, they're all updated in there. And also remember to follow us on our Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Black Tech Queens. And that way you can keep up to date with all of the great things that we're doing as well. And our I Am Remarkable session coming up as well. So uh, go to there to rewatch any videos. And most importantly, share this with everybody, build out our community and help to inspire, aspire and achieve. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karima. It's been a pleasure.